Jessica Ma is Misha Suse Nikavolian Keynes. Agus, we are here in Glengarry, Ontario, and we're in the ancestral home of Ann Newman, whose uh, ancestor was a Macmillan, and she is going to give us a sense of the ancestors who came out from Scotland and um, worked this property and built this house, which she is very much connected to. Thank you very much, Anne, for having me here. Well, thank you. This is the house of John Yon Ban Macmillan. The land was bought by his father uh, about 1850 so that his sons would have land to farm because that was a really big commodity in those days. He uh, came on the farm, he farmed it, and they lived in a little um, uh, log house down to the west of the house here. About 1890, they built this new house, and my grandfather, who was the son of John Yon Ban, um, was the bricklayer, bricked the house up. And uh, so I really have a good sense of feeling when I come in here. I've always been invited to come in here. Um, and we've stayed here for years now and just love it. Now I'll go back a little bit. John Yonban was the son of Yonban, um, who was married to Christy McLeod, or she was known as Granny Vague by people around here. Uh, they had a, a fair number of children, uh, 13, I believe. And um, they um, were, uh, Yon Ban was the son of a chap called um, Alexander the Cooper Macmillan. Now, Alexander the Cooper Macmillan did not um, come straight to Glengarry. He, first of all, in 1773, was on the Pearl that was known to come out into New York. He came out with uh, four brothers. There was Peter, and there was Angus, there was Hugh, and Dougal, and Alexander. And now two of the brothers married while they were out here, Hugh and Peter, and uh, Dougal was married when he came out and brought out his four children with him. And uh, Angus and Alexander um, had been married in Scotland and had children in Scotland, but they did not come out with the family at that time. Of course, if they came out in 1773, that was just before the time of the American Revolution. And they were no sooner set up in doing their trades and their work and their farming when the revolution broke out. And of course, being of the Scots background, they stuck with the English and the British King. Uh, George II at that time. Uh, they, um, at the end of the war, or near the end of the war, the British were, um, uh, the British people loyal to the crown, not just British, there were Swedes and there was other um, nationalities, all congregated um, into New York City, the ones that could not go overland up into Montreal or up into the Niagara region. Um, they congregated in New York City, that was British territory, and the ships came in, the British ships came in to take them out. Now, um, Peter and his brother Hugh, married uh, with children, were on ships that were, took them up to Nova Scotia, and so they raised their, their lifetime in Nova Scotia with their families. Um, Dougal had passed away and had been killed in battle about 1779 in Upper New York State. His wife and uh, her daughters and two husbands, they also ended up in, in Nova Scotia. And... Um, there, that left Angus and um, Alexander, who ended up on one of the last ships out of New York Harbor bound for back home in the UK. Now, Angus spent his time, he got off the ship in Ireland and spent his time with family in Ireland. Alexander went back to Scotland, rounded up his family that was there, uh, children that were there that came out with him on the second run. There was a son, Duncan Band, who eventually ended up on lot 24 and the 8th of Lancaster. There was a daughter, Anne, who was married to an Alan McMillan, and they ended up on the 23rd and the 5th of La Heel, just along the road here. And of course, there was John, his much younger son, John, and he came out with his father, and his father was smart enough in 1802 to put John's name on a listing for land in Finch, Ontario. So he got land in Finch. He eventually bought back in La Heel. Um, they came out of, uh, in the ship of uh, the McDonald ship, was known as the McDonald ship, in 18, um, sorry, 1786. And at that same time, that same year, there was another shipload of people that arrived via overland from New York. That was another great 
great great grandfather of mine he was the scribe for the ship we've got the paperwork he brought a group of people out they left in the fall of um 18, uh, 1785 and when they got to the Gulf of St. Lawrence it was already iced over so they had to go down to New York City and they came in via New York City and came up and spent the winter in Albany and then they went overland up to New to Montreal the following spring uh, the following summer really because the two shiploads arrived within two weeks of one another in August of uh, 1786 must have been quite a Scottish town in Montreal at that time let me tell you two shiploads um uh, I have always been raised with this knowledge and this background. Um, we just talked about it after dinner table. We'd have dinner. We as children would sit at the table with our hands on our lap and just listen to the old people talk about people that had gone before, people that were coming home to visit, uh, just people around the uh, countryside and then as they finished off the topics if they had said something that wasn't really quite nice about somebody well, our uncles would always say to us now you didn't hear that did you and we just had to keep it to ourselves so it's just been years later I would ask my mother uh, what did you know Uncle Ross really mean when he said this about somebody and they, she said well Annie, you really don't need to know that's that's just for us to know. But we were just raised with it you know and the same thing happened on my father's side of the family they were UEs they were the ones that came in, uh, they were the Swedes, the French, the German background that came in through Niagara. Uh, United and, Empire loyalists. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, United Empire loyalists that came in through Niagara. Uh, so the two main spots for United Empire loyalists basically were for Upper Canada and Lower Canada was Montreal and for Niagara, there were really big influxes. And some people will say to me today, because uh, I'm involved with the United Empire loyalists, well, you know, um, uh, where, where did they go to? And I said, well, they went to refugee camps. Many people don't know about that. But Canada had refugee plan, uh, sorry, refugee camps at the end of the American Revolution or toward the end of it up in Montreal. Big camps. There were five of them. And people had to come up there to be registered so that the country would know who was coming into the country, uh, what what family they belonged to, and then that also helped for them to get their, their monies and means for food and uh, for uh, working implements to get to get started on their, their new life. So today when I educate children at school, because uh, many s children in the Toronto area where I come from are um, refugees from other parts of the world, so I say to them, well, you know what? My family was really one of the first refugees to Canada back in the in, in the uh, 1700s so that was that's really something that gets their interest they want to know what life was like here then well certainly isn't anything like it is today <laughs> not at all they didn't even have books to read um mm -hmm. i'll let you take it over You're gonna well i am struck by a couple of things i'm struck by the way you were raised and how similar it is to the way i was raised although my family came down from Canada, my grandfather came down from Canada, and uh, his his grandmother was Mary McMillan, and her father was the chieftain that brought everybody out on three ships in 1802 to Grenville, Quebec, and many of them came over to Glengarry, Ontario. But um, the the uh, Keyneses lived in Grenville on the other side of the river from here, and eventually went down to uh, St. Thomas and London, but. Um, he left St. Thomas and came down to Reading, Pennsylvania to be a church musician. And I was raised by sitting around the kitchen table or when we drove somewhere, my mother would say, well, now remember this. And she would tell me stories and tell me ancestors. And I said, mother, you already told me that. And she said, that's because I want you to remember it. And my sister and I were brought up with the knowledge of our ancestors on both sides of the family, which had Scottish. And um, so I'm struck that you did that too. I would imagine that you didn't feel that you were very different from anybody else around here, whereas down in Pennsylvania, I thought my family was weird because there wasn't anybody else like us. We were surrounded by Germans. So how did you feel growing up um, knowing your ancestors and how has that impacted you now today? In who you know yourself to yeah. be. Well. When you're down here in Glengarry in this area, and I think Susan would agree too, is that um, everybody is a cousin one way or another, either through marriage or um, 
biologically. And so everyone is ready to help each other at all times. And I'm going to give you a, um, an example of a really current situation. Uh, an elderly man lives along the road, and one winter when he was going out the back stoop of his house, he fell and he broke his hip. He had to go into the hospital, obviously, for an operation. And he took a little while, being the elderly person he was, it took him a little while to get um, um, up and mobile and starting to walk again. Of course, the whole time he was fretting about his farm and about his uh, crops that were in or were going to be put in. Well, the farmers around the area banded together after they got their own work done. They went out to his farm and they cropped it. And of course, he was happy about that. He was a little more quieter at his daughter's place. And then he got fretting about, okay, I've got to bring the crops in. I got to get out. So he went out driving one day and came home um, by the way he was staying in Maxville so he came home here to La Hill and he was really kind of devastated because the crops weren't in his field and so he went to visit um, a, a cousin of mine and asked him about it. he's always oh, he says we took the crops in about a week and a half ago it's all gone it's all gone for you you don't have to worry about it the money will be in your bank account very soon so even today people in this area will pitch together to help somebody who's got some distress within their family. Um, they're there for them. They're there when the people are ready to talk about it. And if they're not ready to talk about it, they're just there to, as they pass by, give them a little pat on the shoulder. Now, I was raised with that feeling uh, and, and in Glengarry here. I was raised in Toronto for most of my years. And um, it's a really different feeling in a large city. I realize that. you, If you belong to a church, that helps to build a family uh, atmosphere atmosphere that you can go on and do things and have people to talk to but it's still very different from being in the home area of where you're oh, as my mother was raised down here you know um, another exciting thing I could just thinking now as I'm talking years ago when my we used to go on camping trips down to Lake George in the United States and New York there we were coming home one time at Cornwall and we were coming to the Customs and Immigration, and uh, it was at a time when it was the ferry crossing to get across the Cornwall. They have a nice, big, beautiful bridge now. It was ferry crossing. And this red-headed um, uh, uh, immigration officer comes up to my father's side. My father was driving. My father rolls down the window, talked to him, and the fellow says, well, well who are you bringing in? My, my father's I'm bringing my wife and my four children and, uh, and that. And so he bends down, he looks across, and he says, Elizabeth! Welcome home. And that was it. There was no questions asked. We were on the ferry and on the way across to Cornwall. That was the fastest crossing I've ever had. <laughs> so, But people look out for one another, even when they... Um uh, not as much now, but years ago they used to have in Montreal and Ottawa, Toronto particularly, to the three cities, they used to have um, Glengarry clubs. People would bound together to be at Glengarry clubs and they would have weekly or monthly dances, I guess, or monthly times together, which leads me to another story. <laughs> Another Macmillan descendant, um, his uh, his name was Lachlan, and we down here had always called him Lachlan. And um, my mother and father were at, were at a Glengarry um, con uh, Scottish country dance uh, evening, and somebody said to him, oh, you're from Glengarry, um, you, you must know Lackey. And my mother said, Lackey, I don't know any Lackey. So he took him across to introduce him. Lachlan says to my mother, oh, Elizabeth, my cousin, you're here. Mom says, yes, Lachlan, I'm here. And we always laugh about that because the people in Toronto can't, don't have any Gaelic background, don't even have the soft spoken. They, they could never say Lachlan. It always came out Lackey or Lachlan. And, and that's not the way we, we said it down here. But that was always kind of a good laugh for our family to hear that too. Um, with the Macmillans, we have a model that says we will aid the distress. And as the Macmillan, our Macmillans in this particular area really like to, to, to endorse that, endorse it around the world, in fact. We help people who maybe aren't as fortunate as we are. Um, I do some help in my home church. Um, our church has a soup kitchen every Thursday during the September to June. I help out with that. I'm there every week, either getting the soup on or making sure everybody else is doing has, has the stuff to work with. Um, on Wednesday, we have at our church we have a, called a um, it's called the Aurora Community Cafe. So it gives you a clue where I come from, Aurora area. They um, 
it's run by um, uh, um, disadvantaged young people uh, that really don't have the skills to get a job they haven't finished school they don't have skills to get jobs so they train them at this cafe then they can move on to get jobs in the uh usually in the food food area of of, of restaurants um and so th- that's just something that was instilled in me from my parents my parents were highly involved with the church my father was highly involved with scouting and my mother was highly involved with um the Women's Missionary Society for the Presbyterian Church. And we, we were just raised that way. It was just, I mean, mom and dad never told us we had to do it. It was basically, we were raised by example between our parents and our grandparents. They were, you know, it was just, it was just expected of us. And we, we never, not like today's people, we never said no, we, we did. We just followed along. Well, since you brought up the church, um, what what strikes me is that Today, even now, in Glengarry, at the Kirken of the Tartan, they, they um, revisit the history of coming out from Scotland, and the church has been the center of the community for the entire time they lived here. And even today, it seems to be attracting people from across Canada who are bound to Glengarry in some way. Throughout the world, especially in North America, the church has declined in membership in all the denominations. And, and, um, And yet, the church, if you think about it, the church in general is one of the few places where people are to be accepted for who they are and where you can find intergenerational community. And... The communities, um, we, we have lost something of a sense of community in the United States, and yet in the churches, that's where you can still find it, and as they say, the faithful remnant. So, um, and you did mention the church and how you're involved in it, but both of us are members of the community of the Tonsured Servant, which is um, an, an order, if you will, within Clan Macmillan, and everybody that has chosen to be a part of that particular group within Clan Macmillan seems to be involved in some way helping those who are less fortunate. So the motto, Misera Sucarera Disco, I learn to succor the distressed, had meaning for me because I was a trauma chaplain and preparing for 13 years to become a trauma chaplain. And you with your work within the church and in the schools and so on, it is a reflection of our Gaelic values. And um, so I'm glad you brought that up. It's one of the last repositories of true intergenerational community and seems to be, um, although there's a decline everywhere and probably in Glengarry as well, people come from all over to attend that Kirken of the Tartan. And maybe you could say something about um, your your sense of the Kirken of the Tartan and its meaning in your life? Okay, the Kirken of the Tartan at St. Columba, um, that is a church where my um, grandfather was an elder for 30 years, and my, my parents were married there, and I was baptized out of that church. Now, every year when we came home for the Kirken of the Tartan, when it got started up, it was a good time when I was growing up as a kid, going out to meet some of my cousins that I nor- normally wouldn't see unless they knew we were home so that um, they, um, they could come to visit. But to this day and age, um, even for yesterday when I was there, um, I feel such a peace in St. Columba, and the service is um, um, just fills me with great gratitude for what my ancestors had done before me because life wasn't easy for them. They had some rough times. And they the always had good times. Yeah, the yeah, right. Too. Yeah, celebration of, of their lives and their ancestors. Um, I just, I just love it. I love the music. I love the singing. Um, I love the hymns they pick. Um, and Glengarry, and my, my home. home. Yeah, Glengarry, my home, which I have to say I read as at my mother's funeral up in, uh, in Toronto. And um, I really wasn't sure I was going to get through it all uh, because she had asked for it and she'd asked me to read it. And I remember looking out into the congregation before I started and there was my cousin giving me the thumbs up. I thought, gosh, I can get through it now. You know, Stanley's giving me the thumbs up. 
However, um, uh, I really do enjoy church at any time, really. I find a real peace when I get inside, and I feel a real fulfillment. And I, um, I've had instances in the past when I'm supposed to get up to speak, and I've got such a head cold, I can't speak. And as I'm walking up the front to give my speech, my head cold disappears. This goes right out my head. Then when I go back to sit down, it comes right back in. So I know God's there helping me along to make sure that I get everything done that I'm supposed to get done. Yes, that hymn, Glengarry, My Home, is very touching. And I, have, I, do, I do really well with it for the first three verses. And then we get to the last one, and I, I can hardly ever do it. But it was a modern hymn written yeah. here um, that's, that's taken all over the world probably by now. I know I've sung it in other parts of the world for people. And uh, it's, it's one of those fine gems that's going to last into the future. So um, can you say something about the people that you had here on the weekend? And um, we, we, uh, it was held in honor of some guests from New Zealand that are McMillan's. Yeah. Yes, we had uh, Duncan McMillan and his wife Christy from New Zealand that um, he de uh, had decided within the last year to do a tour of Eastern Canada. And he contacted me. Um, I had met him for um, the last time on a Hebridean trip with the McMillans in Scotland. But he contacted me and he wanted to do Western Canada. He had this really fantastic trip um, mapped out, and I thought, Mom, you must be going to be here for six months to get around here. But um, so I said to him, You better tone it down and decide. So he decided to do Eastern Canada. He did the Maritimes, he was at the Anniston Ish um, um, Games, um, he was at some folk art um, musical night in Nova Scotia, he was in Prince Edward Island, he did Quebec City, and he did Ottawa. Now he's on his way to Toronto today to fly home from Toronto on uh, Friday. But he's been out here about a month. Um, Certainly, he's got a lot of other things he wants to say. So we had, um, it, it, we did invite him. Uh, however, he wasn't able to stay, but he did come out. He was out at the games yesterday. He brought his banner from New Zealand, the New Zealand with a smaller New Zealand Macmillan banner. He brought that out with him, and he marched in the parade with us at uh, at the noon hour uh, at the Maxwell Games. And the Tartans. Yeah, the yeah, clan the, clan, the clan parade, yeah, the big clan parade. And um, I was thought we were going to be kind of sparse with the Millens, but at the last minute, a whole group of them showed up, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But we did it for him. Then people staying here for the weekend was basically my own immediate family that stayed here overnight but uh yesterday um i had um mcmillan based friends uh that were at the kirkin of the tartan they were all invited back to to come here there was um john d mcmillan uh, john b mcmillan and his wife blanche who happens to be the the abbot of the cts community of the tonsil servant um she was here um uh, duncan did stop in he had to pick up his banner he did stop in and he talked to a few people our uh, ernie mcmillan from next door and his wife margaret were here uh, carlisle mcmillan from kirk hill was here and uh, susan was here too. From Boston. Uh, Boston, yeah. So it was quite, 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 quite a, an, in, uh, quite a group of people from all over. Well, my brother that was here too is from uh, Boone, North Carolina. You had Robert and Colin. Um, yeah, and my brother Robert's James. My brother James. James, and he's from Boone, North Carolina, wow. and he was here. My sister Margaret, and my niece and nephew, and my the youngest one that was here was two months old. She she came in in the morning she, yesterday, and they went to Montreal for the day. Um, their their father had never been up to Canada before, so they thought they might as well do Ottawa and Montreal in one fall swoop. So th they did. Um, what I wanted to say, too, is my brother James uh, was here and came up is because uh, an unfortunate situation in April when I was ready to go down to visit him, I got a phone call one morning and he told me that his eldest son at the age of 30 had been found dead at home. And so on the Saturday night after the Highland Games, we all gathered at St. Columbus Cemetery to bury his, uh, his ashes in the cemetery bef beside uh, one of his grandfathers. So I gave everybody that was there that time the history of the family that's buried in that cemetery and it goes back to a fourth great grandfather uh, he wasn't a Macmillan he was a McRae but uh, that he and I took the young kids over they wanted to see where he was buried so I took them up to the back and around the back of the church to the other part of the cemetery and showed them where Donald McRae was buried um, 
So several Gaelic values come to mind. The generosity and hospitality of um, the Macmillan family that hosted the gathering yesterday here at the house, which is a century house. Is that what you call it? It's um, Century Farm. Century Farm. Farm Can yeah. you explain what that is? Well, it got its designation of a century farm, and I'm not sure the date. That's because the farm had been in the same family for a hundred years, um, and I know the farm was the land was bought about 1850 um, before um, Yom Band had passed away, and he passed away in 55. So um, it's a hundred years, and this this was a while back. I remember the sign is up against the house now. Um, the change eventually broke, I guess, rot it through. Uh, but it's Century Farm is 100 years old w within the same family, following down generation after generation. So generosity and hospitality was exemplified yesterday, as is by the whole community hosting these games, which are the largest in the world outside of Scotland. And uh, loyalty to family and clan and... and uh, those, those are sometimes in short supply. And I'm struck by the fact that in the United States we're so mobile, everybody's mobile. And, um, and yet, people have places they go back to, to their homes, but rarely do they go back to a place where people have lived on the same farm for over 100 years. So that's quite remarkable. One of the things that I did in preparing to be a chaplain was we were to study family systems theory and we were to trace a red thread back through all of our ancestors as far back as we could go. And of course in the group I could go the furthest, being Scots. And um, we were to look for what is that red thread that exists through the generations. Well, I'm sure there are many, but the one that I found that struck me right away was that um, that you pick up and move when you can no longer live where you are. And they certainly did that. They could no longer live within the system imposed upon them in the highlands and the clan system, the, the, the uh, land system of the clan owning the land collectively had collapsed. And so they picked up their community, and in particular the immigration my ancestor led, with three ships and brought everybody on three ships. And they went to where there were already people. So the people in Grenville said, well, winter's coming and there's nobody over here. Let's go over where those other Highlanders are. And many of them never returned, but some did. But they, they picked up and they went where they had to go when they could no longer stay where they were. And I see that throughout the generations. And America is a lot of that. And we've become such a mobile society. And I suspect that the roots are back in Europe of why. And that just got passed down. But at any rate... The, those Gallic values are alive and strong and here in Glengarry and they have spread out across Canada. You're in Toronto. I have cousins in Manitoba and all across Canada. One cousin owned the last placer mine on the Klondike on Hunker Creek and she was a Keynes and Macmillan out of London, Ontario. So um, we have been this, this afternoon for um, a short time with Ann Newman who is a Macmillan, and she has shared in, in the way maybe our bards in the past would have done, remembering huge amounts of information and the details which she grew up with. And it's an old tradition that I hope many of you uh, begin to look in your own families and to see what's there and to pass that on to your children in the way that Anne's family's been doing and my family's been doing and which is very much a part of Glengarry. I heard from some of the Macmillans in the past that they would sit on the porch in an evening or in the morning and they would argue about if you were out of the Duncan Ban or the Duncan Do or out of which group of Macmillans you were out of and um, and then try to clarify the genealogies and I don't think that happens too much in many places and so we've experienced a bit of that this afternoon and I want to thank you for having us in this place again and um, and it's been lovely so Bianak Yelit Huladunya and this has been Gaelic Women 
Know your culture and live it.